Good evening. I think we're alive. Could we be live? I think we are. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and also all those who identify in between and beyond the spectrum. My name is Carolina Maciel de França, and I'm your host for tonight's School of Resistance, a live stream format that invites experts on change to discuss valuable formats um, and alternatives for the future and to create a blueprint for a politics of resistance, which we all need. Our topic tonight for the 11th episode of School of Resistance is reproduction, family and the body. And we will be discussing contemporary feminist futures with my guests Alexandra Sidoruk from Lodz Poland, a University of Lodz Poland, an international relations student and also a board member and or I'm not sure founder or ask later of human rights organization Girls for Girls and also from Philadelphia, Sophie Lewis, whose first book is entitled Full Surrogacy Now, Feminist, Feminism Against Family, and explores and, might I say, defies the notions of nuclear family and motherhood. So before we dive in, I would like to thank our partners, uh, the National Theatre in Ghent, the IIPM, International Institute of Political Murder, Academie de Kunste, Kulturstiftung des Bundes and HowlRound Theatre Commons for inviting us here tonight also to make it possible to discuss these topics and to allow all of those who joined us tonight to learn. Oh, for those who are watching, engaging is possible. Uh, we have three channels on which you can send questions and remarks. Please use our email, School of Resistance Art and T Ghent. Dot be or the chat on Facebook Live or Twitter by hashtag School of Resistance to get in touch with me or our wonderful experts here tonight. Lastly, to my guests, wonderful and thank you for joining me tonight and sharing your knowledge. I would like to start by asking you both how you would like to be uh, addressed. Are there any pronouns that you would like to be used when I refer to you tonight? in specific. Thank you, Carolina. She, her is fine for me. All right. And same here. She and same. her. Okay. So we are three hers here tonight. Alexandra, I would like to start with you. Uh, since uh, the situation in your country has been deteriorating, uh, especially since 2016, culminating in the uh, almost complete ban on the right to abortion that was passed last two months ago, end of October. Would you care to sketch the Polish situation regarding female rights and introducing your organization, Girls for Girls, and what you do to prevent this from deteriorating? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great opportunity. And thank you, Sophie, for being here. Um, I, uh, I'm very happy. Uh, that I have this opportunity. Um, so in Poland, situation is very difficult to understand it. We have to kind of get back to go back to what happened when Duda um, won presidential elections and then where um, next elections uh, were um, won by peace, uh, our ruling party. Um, and since then, a lot of bad things started to happen really, you know, on every field you can imagine. Um, the rule of law is not respected. And this was, uh, we know that they have their plans and <clears throat> what they did to law and constitution and courts um, in Poland uh, was just a step to make um, to have a bigger plan and to um, push some ideas that they have. And this is what is happening right now. So on 22nd of October, our constitutional, so-called constitutional tribunal, because it is not legally uh, selected um, tribunal, so it's so-called tribunal, uh, they uh, decided that 
abortions due to any kind of malformations of the fetus um, that are, you know, can end in this fetus actually not being able to live or uh, women who's pregnant may end up um, in a very bad and dangerous situation for her health and her life. Uh, they decided that abortion due to those causes is unconstitutional, that it should not be legal. And the worst thing is that this is like 98% of all of the abortions in Poland. The um, mm -hmm. Sorry, the, how, how many are there? Do you have a number? I don't, I don't actually have a statistics. It's like around, um, I think, um, thousand ish, a little bit more than thousand. So like 98% of them, uh, in Poland were due to those, uh, malformations, right? Um, so we have the very restrictive, we still have very restrictive, um, abortion law here in Poland. And it all started with this so-called compromise. Uh, it's basically a deal between politicians and church. And um, it means that women can have an abortion in three cases when there's this defect of uh, the fetus, when it's dangerous for a woman's life, or when it's because it's because of the rape. And the rest, 2% of the abortions, were because of um, the rape. So um, right now we don't really know what is happening because um, this um, sentence, this ruling should be published um, by like, it was supposed to be a month ago, but it still didn't happen, which is basically illegal, uh, but we are kind of used to uh, them not respecting the law and constitution. So, um, We've been protesting since then, like uh, when we first heard what is happening and when, you know, the Chief Justice, Julia Przyłemska, uh, announced um, the ruling, um, people started to protest and we've been protesting ever since. First, it was like day after day, every day, no matter the weather, no matter if people were tired, they were still protesting. Um, and um, Right now, we are kind of waiting for what is going to happen next uh, because the law isn't published. They have to find some kind of solution. And I think the worst thing about this um, is that we are still in the same place that we were when this um, compromise was uh, created, right? So we have church and we have politicians who are, you know, having some kind of political games between them. Um, we have president who is offering us some kind of funny deal once again. We have a ruling party, so some of them wants to get back to the compromise and some of them wants the further ban. So they don't know what's happening, actually. They didn't expect this to be this big, you know, those protests being... Um, uh, I think these are the largest protests since the fall of communism. So it's not, you know, a joke to people. They are very mad and they are motivated to keep on protesting. Um, and uh, as it hasn't entered into force, we can't really do much other than protesting um, because they have all the tools. They have court. Um, they have ability to, you know, pass the bill, because even if we have a posit opposition in parliament, they don't have a majority, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever peace will propose may, um, may come into force, but not what uh, opposition has to offer. So, um, and yeah, what also is to have this kind of um, view on Poland, it's, also, it's important to uh, remember that we have also one of worst access to contraceptives um, here in Poland. It's very hard to get a uh, pills, for example. And um, abortion is a topic that have been very close to me as I uh, believe that I'm a woman who can decide on my body. And as uh, as we, my organization, um, Girls for Girls, uh, would sees it as a 
human right, fundamental human right, and um, and we see abortion as a healthcare, as a medical treatment, for example, right? So uh, we are actually right now, in our opinion, fighting for a human rights in Poland. And uh, this was very important for me. As you said, in 2016, 16, we started protesting um, because they were trying to, you know, again, pass the uh, bill with um, further abortion ban, but that didn't happen. They got, you know, scared of uh, what was happening. And um, yeah, now they are trying to use the pandemic, which is very um, dangerous uh, for them as they didn't expect what, uh, what would grow out of it. And they are kind of losing, you know, the control over uh, all of this. Um, so yeah, it's kind of sad to think that um, I started my activism because of a situation, a woman's situation in Poland um in 2016 and now that i am actually thinking more about you know political active uh, activity and you know becoming more professional than just protesting i'm still here you know uh, because of the women's rights uh, fight so this is not going to change any soon let's be honest right so but the good thing i think is this uh, is that um we have a new movement here in Poland, right? We have people who wouldn't normally protest, or we have people who um, weren't even interested in politics, right? And or maybe uh, in feminism, sorry. Yes. Exactly. We have people who are actually seeing also what the church has done over mm -hmm. the years, right? Yeah. Yeah, Alexandra. And, um, sorry, you were you were about to finish the thought. I, I was just struck by how, as we've been discussing the, the situation on the woman's body, all we have been discussing up till now has been church and politics. So you rightly asserted that the control over female bodies is so so much manip manipulated by um, goals determined not by health issues, as you said before, but issues that are led by economic ideologies and political ideologies or religious. Yeah. Um, and as you mentioned, um, Poland has already was already before this one of the most restrictive countries on policies on contraceptive supplies and family planning. Um, also, I read that you were one of the few countries that required prescription when you need emergency contraception. So you have to go to a doctor who then can deny it to you on base on basis of personal beliefs. So your doctor can deny to help you. And that's not even speaking of women living in remote areas or who are afraid to go to doctors. So uh, the it seems to me that the problem that you're facing and that your organization might have as a challenge is that even as this um, doesn't pass this bill, because the EU is very much looking towards Poland. If you pass this bill, we're gonna, we're gonna. Um, yes. So the European Union are very, uh, um, uh, very much watching the Polish government. Maybe that's why, but that doesn't solve the problem that you have um, as a country when these restrictions are implemented. That the, the fear and the the uh, the atmosphere of illegality and clandestinity that drips and sips into the society. Um, maybe making it more difficult for women to get the, the kind of help that then health um, aid that they need, no? Yeah, most definitely, you know, uh, even, you're right, even if this is not going to be published, right, mm -hmm. this, uh, this law, because this isn't even a bill, it's constitutional tribunal, which will be much harder to, you know, fix in the future when we will have a different government. Um, even uh, if they will not publish it, we are in a very dangerous situation where ideology and religion are, you know, being more important than, you know, health. And there is no even place for discussion, right? When uh, the Constitutional Tribunal announced uh, their, um, their judgment, their uh, sentence, 
Then uh, our president, a few days uh, later, said that he would like to talk about this, but he was supposed to talk about this way, way, way before when there was even a possibility for this kind of judgment to be passed, you know, and announced. So they, uh, and even if there was a discussion, which there's not, they don't want to discuss with us. And when they are actually, you know, talking about abortion, they are talking uh, from this ideology, right? Mm -hmm. They thinking that we are going to kill children. And this is, you know, this is very dangerous situation because they don't want to have any uh, facts and like arguments that we can provide them because we are not here to, you know, fight with them. We are here to improve women's situations. And, yes. you know, um, this is kind of significant also, as um, as I said a few days um, uh, earlier when I was on a different panel, we are kind of in this, right now, this is the end of those 16 days activism and, and, uh, against gender-based uh, violence, right? Today is the Human Rights Day. And I think what is actually happening here in Poland right now is the best example of gender-based violence when we have government who doesn't want to give us an access to a funda fundamental rights, to our health, and to, you know, our, they are um, blind to see what we are dealing with, right? Yes. So they say to us that we have to give a birth, but when, for example, a woman is giving birth to a children with disability, they are not giving any help. Any and help. also, yes, and also to as I go on to Sophie, which is exactly the moment of ideology critique that uh, I think she would share with you, and not even when we talk about disabled children, but having perfectly healthy children is also of, uh, has also an immense impact on the female body. I will come back to the numbers and the Polish situation. We, are, we will be meandering throughout. But I would like to um, allow Sophie to uh, join us in, in what Alexandra was saying in, in that uh, when I read that you, that you said that these situations, situations like these, like in Poland, like in your country, like in my country of origin, Brazil, these situations are not social, they are, uh, they are social, not natural. They are uh, constructs, right? Things that have political and economic reasons. So we made them this way so we can unmake them this way. Sophie, that's how you see it. Yeah, thank you, um, Carolina and uh, Cassia and Alina and Howlround and Alexandra. It's um, it's really um, exciting and an honor for me to be in conversation with, um, you know, a, a comrade on the on the front lines of a historic abortion struggle. Um, as I see it, um, I mean, as I was coming into this conversation this morning on a, such an important day. I hope that by the time we finish this conversation, Argentina will also have legalized abortion. Um, and I'm personally, I'm sure we're all feeling this way, in awe of Argentinian feminism today and really crossing my fingers that their victory comes about as we speak. Um, I was thinking that really my role here, I, as I imagine the reason why I have been invited to, to talk with Alexandra is, you know, less um, as someone with, you know, useful political strategy to inform activism, because unfortunately, right now, I'm, I'm less of an activist than I used to be, and I'm more of a writer and a thinker. But the ideas in my writing on care and social reproduction and the ideas in my book, uh, Full Surrogacy Now, um, have perhaps some, uh, some tools um, that uh, can be uh, useful to think about um, for those doing concrete abortion struggle, um, and and but mainly, I think I have uh, m much more to learn 
um, from from Alexandra uh, in this conversation. I suppose one thing, if you don't mind me lingering a little um, on the Polish situation, um, it's it's really um, intriguing to me um, whether there is any strategic or tactical potential um, to you know rejecting this framing. I noticed that we talked about a thousand ish. Um, abortions in Poland a year, um, and that is the Polish Ministry of Health's official data. Um, of course, the, the the number of abortions really taking place has been estimated by, for example, you know, the Federation for Women and Family Planning, um, which is a Polish feminist NGO, as more, you know, possibly as as high as two hundred thousand a year. So the difference between yeah. 1,000 and 200,000. And I guess my question um, e -E for Alexandra, well. but very sort of humbly, because I'm very aware um, that the US context is not um, equivalent to the Polish context, right? But one of the, the conversation in which um, I have some involvement in, in my um, milieu um, has to do with um, a rejection of the the tactic that became dominant in the 90s among um, liberals and feminists uh, in America, where slogans such as safe, legal, and rare um, were taken up. And today, in the 21st century, <laughs> we have a real, um, you know, pulling apart of uh, feminists interested as I am in uh, something a little more like, um, you know, free on demand and not just without apology, but with congratulations, you know, a really not just unapologetic, but full throatedly, you know, pro abortion stance versus the, the establishment uh, kind of, uh, pro-choice movement represented by the leadership of Planned Parenthood, who, uh, for their part, you know, oppose things like clinic defenses um, and sort of vocal uh, on the street kind of contestations of, uh, of the far right and um, the, the, the lawmakers and the people who I would call proponents of forced gestation. Right, because the framework that I propose in my book, which is not a framework I invented, um, but nevertheless has kind of come back um, into consciousness, uh, partly as a result of, of of conversations around full surrogacy. Now, is that you know gestation can be thought of as uh, labour, needs to be thought of as work, and a form of work from which we have, um, if you like, a human right to withdraw, right? Um, it is imperative that for absolutely any reason, a person have the um, the right, which means, you know, a right only means something if there is <laughs> um, free access and infrastructure and support and a lack of stigma, right in that full sense of the word right, to, to not do forced um, unconsensual labor. And, you know, I, I am really a theorist when I, um, when I explore these things um, in the book, rather than someone who is, um, uh, you know, uh, tactically um, testing these things in policy. But I have noticed that some groups such as um, the group NYC for abortion rights has actually taken up this this framing um, and is regularly putting out materials, campaign documents that affirm that gestating is is work, uh, which is I think a way through in some contexts, perhaps not Poland. Who knows? I would love to hear from Alexandra about this, where you can avoid these deadlocks and gridlocks around whether it is you know, killing on the one hand or health care on the other, because I suppose for me the the issue is not to simply to 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 take away um, 
humanitarian and sentimental focus from the figure of the fetus, to put it simply on this other individual, the mother, but rather to think about the the labor, the relationality, and that that perhaps gives us, um, you know, some kind of way out of this gridlock, because when you think about it as as forced work, some of those, um, you know, really tired, frozen sorts of standoffs between innocent, unborn, and you know. Um, selfish woman or whatever can perhaps be be put to one side um so yes i'm just i'm just interested in in alexandra if that's okay <laughs> in in you know how how do we defend you know 200,000 abortions a year not yeah. just 1,000 legal ones, you know? Yes. I'm going to go back to the numbers in a minute because 200,000 is indeed the number that the EU, the European Union, is using, uh, aside from the 30,000 abortions that happen abroad for those who can afford it. So the numbers are larger than than officially um, transmitted. Uh, but Sophie, I'm, I'm going to just uh, summarize some of the things that you've said and I so, also read in an article by Mary Sol, Solis, or Solis, where you say that all gestational work is work because of the immense physical and emotional labor it requires for those who do it. So that's, I think, one thing is sensibilizing people to the, the labor and the, the heaviness of having a child which is so often pre or understated um, by society. And secondly, I've seen you say that pregnancy is extreme sport, which I also like as a comparison, because that would make me a top sporter next to my professional activities. And I'm, I feel more of the, um, as a mother, which I will clearly sit here, I will feel that covers more of the, um, the responsibilities and the, the load that we carry but when we do, when we combine the things. And then going back to Alexandra, it's the perfect, I think, bridge to um, talk about when uh, this heaviness, this immense physical and emotional labor is imposed upon a female body, uh, whether in terms of lack of uh, education or information preventing us from unwanted pregnancies or to preventing pregnancies that are unwanted from being terminated and, and thus putting us in the position where uh, gestation uh, happens more often, not always as a choice. What, what, um, how, how can we explicitly link this to politics and, and religion? What is the benefit of putting women in this position to both of you? Maybe first, Alexandra. Okay. Um, so I uh, actually read um, what you just said, uh, Sophie, and I think this is very interesting. And what you have to say is very, very interested for me, interesting for me, right? And I agree that pregnancy means so much more than just, you know, having a child, right? There's uh, so much, like you said, physical and emotional labor and what people don't realize, um, what actually means to be pregnant. I don't know what, to, what it means to be pregnant, but I read about those stuff. I read about statements of women who didn't uh, uh, go through a pregnancy or didn't carry a pregnancy in a very well uh, way, and it was very hard for them. Many of them also regretted this, right? So I think this vision, let me call this a vision or theory, is, in my opinion, um, very interesting and would probably, and if implemented, could save a lot of lives because we wouldn't have a woman who are, you know, pregnant and they, for example, have to get an abortion in very unsanitary and unhealthy way because there are not many women in Poland who will know that there is, for example, a um, abortion dream team or womanhelp.org where they can get an access to healthy safe abortion so they will do it in a very unhealthy way so if implemented theory that you have sophie 
it could potentially, in my opinion, save some lives and also bring what you said, Carolina, education. And there is a lack of education in Poland. We don't get a lot of from school. We even have a conversations right now in Poland when um, government and church is saying that sex, sex education shouldn't be in, in schools, right? So Same we, in Brazil. They say yeah. that it uh, forces or it, it puts ideas in children's heads so that they start sex earlier. But I yeah, think it's... Yeah, I even heard that um, teachers were, you know, um, huh. were uh, teaching this sexual uh, education. They are kind of um, uh, more likely to molest, molest those uh, children and to rape them. So this is very uh, going on in Poland, apparently. So. Uh, yeah, I think that it would help to bring awareness, to spread education and to make people learn about pregnancy and what it means to be pregnant and what it means to be pregnant uh, unwillingly and not wanting to have children, you know, it would also, um, for example, kind of stop the stigma that we have on women who are, for example, uh, child free by choice. Here in Poland, saying you are child free by choice is like, you know, you're some kind of witch, probably. Um, so it's nice vision that, in my opinion, in for me, it's attractive, this vision that you that you said about uh, this being a, a work and, uh, and all this uh, labor kind of values. Um, but yeah, in, in kind of political strategy, and if we want to be effective, here in Poland, it would uh, it wouldn't be able to you know even propose it and to have, as I said, a discussion even on it, right? Um, so as for me, it sounds very attractive and uh, and something that I would be very interested in exploring and implementing, but it's not um, something that I know would be even accepted in in, in a discussion, right? Because we are just on our way to even inform people that there can be, you know, um, for example, in open relationships, or they can be, you know, uh, not heterosexuals. Uh, so this is just the beginning for Poland to actually talk about some stuff, right? So uh, as it seems very interesting, and I wish we could even have this conversation here in Poland. Yes. There are, uh, it's, oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, that it's it would be very hard for us to happen here in Poland. Yeah, and that's yes. It. I'm following up on on my my own country of birth, which is Brazil, and it's in the same very same position as you in Poland. And I'm struck by how the quality of lives of women are so defined by geopolitics. I I would like to ask Sophie another question, because I don't think you fully explained the concept of your book in full, full surrogacy, where you on, not only talk about gest gestational work, but also of uh, education, child education and care. Mm. And you expand the idea, um, actually define, define the nuclear family, the concept of the nuclear family, the, the ideal family being consisted of a man, a woman, and maybe two children. Or, mm. Uh, so you defy that idea and you strive for larger systems of care where we mother each other. Would you like to maybe elaborate on that and maybe how you can sure. use this idea to tackle the idea of the nuclear family that is? Sure. Um, yes, it's there are sort of several moves that take a little bit of um, unpacking in turn because I, I suppose many of the steps in my um framing are counterintuitive um unfortunately in the present uh left um even though um in the 60s and 70s there was actually a much greater awareness of uh and, and much more familiarity around um slogans and and horizons that now seem kind of crazy or unheard of you know there's a forgetting like a, a mass forgetting that has taken place in the 80s um but in the 60s and 70s you know people were kind of quite familiar with ideas like abolish the family you know it was actually one of these kind of almost 
orthodox Marxist kinds of ideas, as well as, um, you know, a familiar theme of gay liberation and, and, and revolutionary women's liberation. So there is a certain way in which I'm actually, you know, going back to to something paradoxically a bit more traditional within a tradition of of on the ground utopianism, utopianism, um, not as a kind of dreaming of a post political island where everything is fine, but as a as a really kind of um, radical at the root um, practice of concrete engagement with reality that 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 strives for a really livable world. So I'm looking at gestating in a kind of um, almost childlike way, I think sometimes is a good way to explain it. Like rather than uh, accepting from the get go that um, this topic is uh, naturally linked, you know, like this to other edifices like gender and motherhood and so on, I am almost putting blinkers on and inquiring what kind of work is this? And um, it's actually quite astonishing. You know, um, you mentioned extreme sport. You know, I want to be clear. I am not afraid of gestating or anti-pregnancy. On the contrary, it's kind of um, amazing to me that we don't learn more about the, you know, co-productive kind of two-way extraordinary, grisly, exciting, thrilling, dangerous kind of nature of this of this labor. And I, I do think it's important to, you know, get through our heads that 300,000 people a year die doing pregnancy. And if there was any other kind of, you know, job that had that kind of death count, I think we would be trying to really revolutionize that uh, that industry, right? But pregnancy, because it's so naturalized um, and not particularly framed as something we could change in its fundamentals, um, even though, again, I just want to say in parentheses, you know, for over a hundred years, we have had um, thinkers uh, ranging from fascists to utopian, feminists, queer, communists, and so on, all across the spectrum, dreaming about how we might do pregnancy in a completely different way, right? <laughs> like maybe involving aspects of sharing out of the body technologies, kind of, you know, this has been part of our cultural imaginary for a hundred years, the idea of, of helping the human body uh, not bear um, that creative burden on its own, right? But at the same time, as we have those scientific fictions, um, we also just don't seem to want to do anything pragmatic to problematize pregnancy in the in the now as it really exists, you know? So, so somehow it is fine um, for people to get injured and to die doing this um, really, you know, cool, <laughs> um, you know, for many people, easy. That's paradoxically also the case, right? Some people don't find it um, very difficult to do pregnancy, but you know, humans are diverse. We just, I just would like a world in which people are empowered to have pleasurable and non-lethal experiences of gestating uh, on the basis that, you know, let's all, let's all, you know, have fun and, and, and extreme sports are certainly something that I want infrastructure in place for to, you know, to, 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 for people to do freely. So that's kind of the first position because sometimes I'm misunderstood as being, you know, somehow phobic of, of the maternal, you know, and nothing could be, you know, further from the truth because you know, so what I mean by abolition, this is the next step, is kind of the classic um, <laughs> Hegelian kind of sense of the term that means you t you take what is already um, against all odds present in the now. So the, the people who were never meant to survive, in Audre Lorde's phrase, the, you know, the people who have been dispossessed um, and marginalized in the existing um, capitalist regime of reproduction, they have the skills to mother one another and to mother 
themselves collectively. And that and the, so the, those skills, in a sense, that that movement of real families against the family <laughs> is already here. And so abolition would mean taking that kernel of liberatory mothering and and universalizing it so that people's reception of care and mothering um, and all the necessities of life is not dependent on some kind of genetic lottery and not structured according to a tiny sort of scarcity producing unit, uh, which by the way is also kind of ecologically bananas, you know, like living in atomized um, nuclear households is 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 kind of, um, you know, just on, on the level of, let's say, resources, you know, completely, um, you know, irrational in, in our moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, and with COVID, we have, of course, discovered um, that, you know, the, 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 the ideology of family is sort of fictional, right? There have been so many, you know, uh, columns and opinions published by upper middle class people kind of saying, gosh, you know, without without my nanny and without my mommy and without all the people who help me kind of make my autonomous, you know, nuclear household function, it really is quite hard and quite a lot of work, you know, which really makes you think whether that edifice, the family is so, you know, self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, people can recognize that. And yet they don't, they don't follow through and dare to imagine a more thoroughgoing, you know, transformation. <laughs> Sorry, I have a question about that, Sophie, because uh, maybe two short answers, because I, you and me together, we have this ability of making time pass really quickly. So, <laughs> um, but I have two questions regarding that, because when you speak or when you spoke or of um, a utopian feminist future, you spoke of exactly that, of broadening the idea of a nuclear family and expanding into larger systems where, where children are cared for by others as well. But this is a model that I already know from my family, which is both indigenous as, and African. And I think yeah. these ethnicities have far more um, experience with um, not limiting the notion of a nuclear family that much into yeah. two people responsible for everything. And then the second is, uh, when you mean, when you say abolition, do you mean something more like proliferation maybe? Because as I hear you speaking about it, it is not the word that I use when I, in my context of abolition of slavery, where I, where I would like the the definition to be about destruction and about yeah. and about um, uh, dismantling yeah. and not transcending and involving. So, is 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 um, if I were to implement your your theory in my life, would you mind if I used emancipation instead of abolition? <laughs> sure. Yes. There is a lot of debate around this word abolition, and not all you know, black feminists, for instance, whose ideas I'm largely, you know, uh, borrowing when I, when I, as well as the Marxist tradition, wages for housework, wages against housework, and so on. Um, but I, I'm not, uh, I hope, I hope it doesn't um, appear too arrogant to propose this, because it's, it's not, it's fine for people to use whatever language. I would say that several projects in the present and the and the past are sort of family abolitionist, whereas they might not have called themselves that. I guess I was trying to talk about abolition in that sense of um, Aufhebung and universalization. Like when Ruth Pr um, Wilson Gilmore talks about um, prison abolition, it's it's about a building, she says, not yes. just a, a destruction. And yes. there's, there's a kernel of emancipation in the present that gets proliferated to, uh, universally. But this is kind of semantics. It doesn't... It is, it, it, but semantics, as a linguist, uh, I think they are important. And I think I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't uh, but no, not without a struggle, I would let abolition... Sure become okay. something more like just, but we are sisters in the struggle anyway. Um, another one, um, 
you have a question for each other. And in the meantime, I'm going to be reading the questions that came in for you both in the chat. So you, if you have something that you want to check out with each other, this is the moment you can do it without me mm -hmm. in between. And I will be reading and selecting the questions that came in for you. You're okay. I actually have so. um, a question maybe, if had more. Um, because this uh, free, uh, free of um, this model of family, let's say this about, uh, abolish, okay, okay, abolish family. Let's uh, call it uh, abolishing family is, Something that I think would be um, very practical would also teach people. Sorry. I'm sorry. Don't worry. Um, kindness and spreading this uh, care so much more than you know people that are basically your family, um, and it is needed. And I think this is um, remedy for what is happening in Poland, and we are very divided, right? Mm -hmm. So. What I'm interested in is actually how would you even see this you know, coming to life and implementing it in society, in, in community, such as Polish one, right? When we are simply divided in a half uh, because of our, you know, uh, preferences, political preferences, religion or, you know, um, our, uh, our uh, views simply. So as it sounds very attractive to me, and I think this is amazing to think about that we would live in a, in a world like this. Um, it's simply also very interesting to see how would it happen even, right? So, uh, and how to promote such an idea and maybe how to find a way to actually go from theory to practice and to start implementing this on much more, you know, on a much more scale. Yeah. Sophie, I'm adding one small question to that from Alexandra because it's uh, so close to the question that you got in the chat. So Alexandra is interested in implementing your theory and I think she's gonna make a strategy to change Poland. So she's taking notes, yes. And she wants to know how it can be implemented directly and I will be taking notes too. And the one in the chat is asking for your viewpoint. So maybe you can dissect it from commercial surrogacy mm -hmm. as a term and how to make sure that you can implement such a, such a theory in a country, especially so divided, making, while making sure the system doesn't exploit the existing inequalities between mm -hmm. women already. Mm -hmm. So here's your question. Yeah. No, of course. Um, you know, uh, just to be clear, you know, Full Surrogacy Now is not a book that is promoting uh, what we currently refer to as surrogacy, which means commercial, usually surrogacy. In fact, you know, most of my book is uh, really critical of the of, of that industry. It's it's a book that talks about all relations of care and gestating, pointing out that today we also have a new emerging you know, commodified sphere of production of parentage. But contrary to, very, you know, some conservatives who think that commercial surrogacy is somehow threatening to the, the private nuclear household and the whole ideology of family, it's quite the contrary, right? It's, it's, it's an extension of the same logic of uh, children as genetic property um, and so the, the thing that we would need to abolish needs to take into account both this kind of supposedly new, not really that new when you look at the racialized class divisions of labor that under, undergird it, not new at all, right? And the kind of un, unexamined sort of natural site of of reproductive labor. The household doesn't get away scot-free simply because we have you know, a new exploitative uh, zone, you know, commercial surrogacy. That's the point of my book, right? It's trying to think about how we might have solidarity between people who do gestating in paid locations and unpaid ones and wondering how we could, and you mentioned, Carolina, your experience of um, indigenous and African polymaternalisms, how we might return to a sensibility uh, or learn for the first time for many of us 
being settlers and, you know, how to relate to not just children, but each other as though we don't belong, as though we aren't property, right? Children in the phrase of the sisterhood of black single mothers in 1980s USA, you know, do not belong to us. They do not, they belong only to themselves and they are the responsibility of all of us, right? So how we get there concretely is, you know, I, I'm not being flippant when I say, <laughs> luckily not, something for me to work out in a book of of theory and critique. However, you know, I, I think, um, you know, <laughs> so since I've been asked directly, um, the Polish situation might uh, benefit from some of the same sorts of conclusions we've reached in the US where, you know, um, apologizing, triangulating, uh, reassuring our enemies, you know, that abortions um, are done regretfully um, and sorrowfully um, and only when absolutely necessary is a bad strategy. I think we need to understand that for centuries, those who make the world and who make one another, which is kind of all of us, but or ideally would be all of us, but you know, historically has been racialized, feminized human beings, that they have also been um, skilled uh, and at the art of unmaking life as well as making it. So enslaved people have always, you know, shared the knowledge required to do abortions. Abortifacient herbalism thrived among enslaved uh, a sort of uh, uh, labor industries, right? And I am a proponent and a, and a supporter without, um, without reserve of all those underground, uh, still today, you know, clandestine networks of mutual aid and healthcare provision and smuggling and abortifacient airlifting and all the means by which women have uh, and, and, pe and pregnant people of all genders have given one another access uh, to, to freedom from unwanted pregnancy, right? And, you know, th that is something we need to celebrate and not simply agree with our enemies is somehow something that needs to be minimized, right? I think we need to ex sort of really stop being on the defensive with this and, and show that people who look after generations, you know, children, and 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 all generations are also people who sometimes kill fetuses. And I am not afraid. I wonder if we could do because this strategy is not winning right now against the far right. What if what if we agreed that there is a killing of a fetus that is involved in the labor of social reproduction and that we are not afraid of saying that because it is a, a wonderful thing that makes women happy, right? The, the, the studies show that abortions make people happy. <laughs> this is like a sociological fact. Um, so why do we have to agree that it needs to be eradicated? Of course, there would be less abortion in a world in which we had real gender freedom and proper contraception and, and, and. But that's, that's a separate question. In the present, abortion is good, you know? That's what I want, I think, to hear people people say and show that it goes together with a genuine commitment to lives worth living. I agree uh, that um, we need to kind of say that abortion is good and that's what we are actually trying to do here in Poland. And um, I actually, as you said about these, you know, killing a fetus, uh, I found this uh, video of yours when you talk about, you know, abortion being unnecessary um, violence, right? And I thought about this as a kind of strategy to use, but um, you see what we are struggling here in Poland, as I said, is education and trying to give them an argument, right? And I, I would like to imagine, you know, just having a, a public conversation with my government and saying to them that this is a form of killing, but we have to justify this and we need to defend this, right? 
it wouldn't be able even to happen because we're just on our way to talk to them about the medical issues that are, you know, uh, associated with uh, abortion and that people are not aware of. So I, I agree that we need to kind of normalize abortion and say about facts and statistics that you said, which are very important, that abortion brings happiness and brings freedom and it makes people who are pregnant uh, and who will make an abor uh, do an abortion make them happier and this is uh, this is a fact and it's important to say but yeah we are just on our way to kind of let them know that this is actually happening right because then they will go out and say that they have some other data or statistics and that we are not right so there is no place for such a discussion but yeah i agree that we have to say that abortion is totally okay and it's normal and it makes us happy and uh, this should be this should be normal. We shouldn't say about any kind of regret because there is no regret. Mm. I don't need well, to Well, maybe know. I, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, There's some I delay. <laughs> need a big reason, a big story behind an abortion to understand it, right? For me, it mm. would be easy. I, I don't want to have a children, so I will do an abortion. There is no big story. There is no big mm -hmm. motivation behind it or, you know, a full regret, difficult situation. This is simple, right? I want an abortion and I will be very happy if I will be in a position that I will have abortion and I don't have to carry a pregnancy. So Might I, I suggest, to... maybe, yeah. sorry, Sandra, yeah. another, another delay, so I keep interrupting you, I'm not intending to cut, but might I suggest that we include pregnancies as well as a thing that can make you happy if you choose to be pregnant and be a mother and that an abortion can make you happy if it's your choice to abort. But I think an abortion that is forced is also not a source of happiness. So of I'm, I'm, I think we are here struggling to define um, a woman's right to create and destroy what happens in her body. No, um, I, I may, maybe not, but I have one more question for um, for Alexandra, and then maybe a time for a question that I made myself. I'm just trying to put the audience first here before we have to close up. So, Alexandra, uh, here's a question from, from the audience. I don't know who it came from. Alexandra mentioned that the movement that is now going on in Poland has been able to reach out to a broader audience. What do you think were the main reasons for that? And what can we learn from that for the international feminist struggle for reproductive rights? A part of this answer I might mention was already given by Sophie when you said, Sophie, as I understand, to invest in underground networks, in illegal and clandestine, not official networks that invest in helping people who are, have acute needs, right? So keep investing in that. And then maybe the rest of the answer for you, Alexandra. I'm going to repeat. Yeah, could you repeat the question? So you mentioned that the movement that is going on now in Poland has been able to reach out to a broader audience. So your, the people, the number of people that uh, joined your, you, your organization or your views is growing. Mm -hmm. How come is a question? And might I add, but I lost the question. Here is, what do you think were the main reasons and what can we learn from that for the international feminist struggle? for reproductive rights? Um, so I think there is, so it all became, it all started with this um, uh, abortion ban, this this uh, this um, idea that we should have further abortion ban. And this was the main reason we even started protesting. But throughout those protests, I realized that it became much more because we not only have, you know, demand of liberalization of abortion. We have so much demands now and it's actually became, becoming kind of, you know, more political because we have a women's strike uh, whose leader is Marta Lempart and they are, you know, organizing a council that is finding ways, solutions, legislative solutions also on how to fix all the mess that peace um, made. Um, but it became not only a access and liberalization of abortion of course access to contraception uh, 
separating state and church and um, independence of a constitutional court and of course uh, the chief uh, justice uh, who is now not very uh, independent um, and all the things that peace uh, done throughout the years for example to health uh, system this is becoming much much more you know there are things that peace did during the pandemic and their, their weak decisions, um, both economic and social, what they are doing also to LGBT community. It, it, it's like, you know, adding that and adding everything that they've done. And, you know, this is just a huge explosion right now of people realizing what they are doing on every field, you know, every field in this country is, is in a weak, weak state. So I think that uh, all that uh, if we add all of this, we have a picture of country that is not stable and it's, uh, you know, on the on the easy road to get in a really bad situation, like, for example, you know, Belarus, right? So um, I think that it touched so many uh, groups of our society that are now coming together this is kind of you know uh, this is a plus of this this situation that we are coming together and there are you know women uh, who are for example very religious and have children and would never do an abortion but they are here fighting with us there are men who have similar uh, views right um they are lawyers students everyone, every age group, you know, and this is what is very, this is amazing, right? And no matter how this will end, and I, I would, you know, Italy, it would end in, you know, um, in having a new government or earlier elections, but that's not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So I think if we would have to learn uh, something from this is that, first of all, democracy, human rights are given to us and they can be taken away at any time. And as we still have to, and are, we have to call Poland a democratic state, we are, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a weak state of this democracy, right? And we can't do much and they have all the tools, they have the control uh, of what is happening. And um, yeah, so we have to remember that democracy and human rights, even if they are given to us, can be taken away at any time. And I think, uh, as I said, this coming together and seeing, you know, the cause that is bringing us together is very important in order to have a successful, you know, uh, successful, I would like to say, you know, some kind of uh, solutions. But as I said, we are kind of preparing those for, for the next elections or for you know for resignation of the government um but yeah coming together and you know adding the dots and seeing that someone else you know um situation for example lgbt community touches all of us right because there was first lgbt community and there are women right now so uh so we're you, you know we are all together in this and it's it, it, we have to remember about this no matter, you know, what kind of field they are going to destroy next. So I think this is a lesson that I that I have right now, you know, and not letting kind of um, government ruin this because they are they are trying to do it, you know, you know, they are, for example, threatening us with arrests or or saying that we are, you know, putting people at risk because of the pandemic. Right. But they are. They were the first that um, made this situation happen and they made us go to the streets, you know, uh, during the pandemic. So, yeah, having this kind of little utopia that you said about during those protests, we see so many people together, you mm. know, and uh, the best, the best, okay. So maybe the most emotional for me moment was the day that um, Constitutional Tribunal, um, you know, announced uh, this new law. And everyone in a few hours later decided to, you know, gather together and be together for this moment. So, um, you know, going through this with other people who, who you wouldn't normally, you know, uh, uh, see it doing is, is something that reminds me that we are really all in this together. And if mm -hmm. we will not do it, you know, 
collectively, then we will not do it at all. You're introducing my last question, Alexandra. Uh, perfectly. I have another question in the chat, but it's about uh, bodies and gestational work and work and capitalism. And I think that's a, bit, a little bit too um, tight in time to go into a question that might easily take up half an hour in answering. I would prefer rather to slowly check out and offer some space for Sophie to maybe get herself out of the framing that I proposed just now. And to both of you, my last question would be, um, as being bodies of resistance in, in um, or against a system that has been so widely uh, spread worldwide and so that is so powerful and so ingrained in all, all, all the, the, the facets of our lives, like religion and work and politics. So what do you do for self-care or for um, resistance strategies that you use or find useful to, to ensure that you can keep struggling on the, on the long run? Because I think that's also important to share not only the knowledge, but how to, how to stay sane in the midst of insanity or... Okay, so um, I can answer this question, I guess. Um, um, that's a very good question, actually. Um, there was a moment when I found myself, you know, very exhausted. Not gonna lie, there were like, you know, 20... Uh, actually, it was around, you know, 20 days of us protesting and you have all those different areas of your life that you have, right? It's your family that you want to... Uh, have a good relation with and spend time with. You have university, which is the whole other thing that is, you know, uh, consuming your time and your energy. And then you have protests. So finding um, a way to, you know, stay sane is actually something that I'm still learning kind of to do, you know. Um, the best way is for me to I think being with people that, you know, have uh, have a positive impact on me and kind of make me forget sometimes about um, what is happening when I find myself with people, you know, during even after the protests, when I find myself with people that are, you know, uh, kind of can make me forget about what is happening, it's very helpful and, you know, have a actually day or evening as a, you know, just 20 years old uh, student having fun and, you know, relaxing is something that kind of helps me a lot. Reading also helps a lot. Yeah, we all should read. It makes you very, very sane and very healthy. And this is the very way to uh, self-care for me. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that, that this is what I have right now, like briefly. I would agree that um, reading history can be um, quite consolatory in this moment because the, there can seem to so many of us, particularly in this absurd year, like the future has been cancelled to an even greater extent than it was, you know, already feeling in the last few years. But, you know, the the tides of history are really volatile. It's difficult to know sometimes uh, what is immediately around the corner. I mean, even just reflecting on the fact that Poland was the first country in Europe to legalize abortion beyond medical cases, um, you know, it shows us in a sense, you know, how how unpredictable and, and, and I mean, in a sense, it's a warning, isn't it? Um, as our comrades in Argentina were saying, you know, you, you may think the forces we're up against, uh, you know, uh, South American and, you know, but they're coming for you too. You know, in a sense, the the abortion struggle is emerging um, as as one of the great sources of, revolutionary hope. And I think just, just reading about that, I mean, you said not just knowledge, but also strategies. I mean, I, it's, 
I think, yeah, I think we need to understand, I mean, self-care is a collective practice and uh, resisting the individualization of self-care, I suppose, would be my real answer to that. Particularly with COVID, um, we need to recognize that taking care of one another's bodies, including through gestures that seem like gestures of, of, dist- of, of uh, um, uh, privacy and rejection are actually tenderness, technologies of tenderness um, and mutual sort of love, right? But we need to stay connected to one another or perhaps get more connected to one another than we have been for many decades. The fact that, um, yeah, the Polish feminists are, are saying, uh, the Pierre Dalai right? is a, is so generalizable, you know, get the fuck out of here, um, is a, is a message to the establishment that echoes the movements of the squares, you know, the movements, uh, around Occupy. It's, it's a very, uh, you know, universalizable slogan that has, um, you know, ripples and repercussions far beyond the simple matter of reproductive injustice. Uh, reproductive rights, um, and so on. And I think one last thing is that history also teaches us that um, emancipation struggles only succeed when, you know, they don't throw portions of their, you know, of of their allies and and partners in struggle under the bus, right? So when there are attempts, including among the left, to divide, for example, you know, hardworking families, from um, immoral queers, for example, you know, or uh, we need to insist, armed with history, that it, you know there have always been all kinds of family, including that kind of natural biological kind that our enemies have in mind, among you know the ranks of the queer, and it is in fact you know <laughs> queer poly maternal caregivers and many gendered mothers who have ensured the well-being of so many, you know, of, of, of our people throughout, you know, throughout the AIDS pandemic, throughout the sort of uh, crisis of, you know, uh, homeless, queer youth, you know, uh, shelters, um, trans women have always been part of feminist struggle, including in shelters um, and women's refuges. You know, we need to make sure that there are no successful attempts to divide us or or, or, or trade certain thing, policies and goods off um, again, uh, t- t- in order to, you know, t- to keep us um, weaker than we, than we might be. Thank you. And also for that sentence that you threw there, I might just ask you to throw in a final sentence or how do you call it um uh something that you pronounce and then hope to become a reality an assertion an affirmation was it and i I, i'm gonna use that one uh, the part from sophie's um where we should be feel empowered to change the future armed with history so to both of you many maybe any final wishes for the future um, respectively, maybe in your country or worldwide or universe-wide. I won't keep you for that. What's, um, the, what's the ideal future for you? What's the, what's the ideal the, with no restrictions and no, no restrictive church or economic politics? Maybe a future where they would be supporting um, our rights and defending our rights as bodies of of uh, protection of women rather than attacks, throwing attacks. Well, think, yeah, sorry, go on, Alexandra. Um, I think for me, it's it's very easy for me, but uh, very hard to understand it for, for our government. Just let people live however they want, really. If they want to have like, you know, 20 of children and they want to, you know, uh, attend uh, church every week and if that's make them happy let them if there is a woman who doesn't want to have children and wants to be with multiple partners let her be just let everyone live their own lives and 
don't put any labels. Labels are awful. Um, and don't let, you know, anyone kind of um, uh, invade your own privacy and don't do it either. So yeah, just kind of letting people live however they want. It's what is, it's so simple. I mean, very simple. I'm into that, Alexandra. Sophie? Oh, well, you know, I, um, as a killjoy, I suppose I have to mention that none of my real demands can be realized in the absence of, you know, the the overthrow of capitalism, colonialism, these ecocidal, amongst other things, like really, you know, antagonistic to life and to flourishing you know this this cannot happen in one little enclave or one country we need this is a movement that i might call communism with a small c but again nomenclature isn't the, the be all and end all you know the, the, these without um you know massive transformations of this order one can't really imagine a a, a real end to reproductive stratification Right, the system where the reproduction of some lives is assisted and the reproduction of others is sort of depressed <laughs> or desisted. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a pragmatism of utopia. Yeah, we, we, you know, to really have the, the world at which we can glimpse in the cracks of the present, but for all, you know, we're going to have to we're going to have to make a real revolution. But in the meantime, I, I could quote from the um, the manifesto of that group, NYC for, for abortion rights, mm -hmm. who point out, uh, and this was on the you know the the passing of the much venerated by liberal feminists Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Supreme Court Justice, and they said, you know. Because this was this was heralded as a kind of you know terrible you know terrible tragedy for for the future of abortion uh, in this country, which you know is not completely incorrect. But they say we reject veneration of any Supreme Court justice as a form of doubling down on the same failing strategy that got us here in the first place. Um, we reject despair. Our goal is not to preserve Roe versus Wade. In the end. Our goal is to win free abortion on demand as part of universal health care. Um, then the, the, at the end, we call on, yeah, all we have is us and we have the only tools that ever won anything. Protests, refusals, strikes, riots, struggles. We'll need many kinds of tactics for the fight. We call on our comrades across the country to join with us in preparing to protect clinic workers, patients, and each other, because abortion is in our hands. Thank you, Sophie. And also for mentioning Sarah Ahmed and her yeah. Children Manifesto. I think we, we, the three of us have read that and shared it. I would like to thank you. I would love to thank you, both the both of you for expanding my knowledge and my knowledge of theories and strategies um, and hopefully that of our audience tonight as well. Maybe we can have another talk in the future about um, Sara Ahmed alone and strategies and how we have changed the future in the meantime, maybe over in, a, in a year or two. But um, I am I'm so thrilled to have had you here. Any Anything you, you would like to say, Sophie? No, I just wanted to thank you and thank you for putting up with my terrible setup with lighting and technological failures. It's been such an honor to talk to you both, Alexandra and Carolina. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, I thank you. Big pleasure and and I hope we could, you know, do it again in different circumstances after a year, maybe. Yeah. It should be really interesting. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise expect me in Poland for strikes. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. And for the audience, we will be closing up here tonight. So keep in touch with Antigent or the other partners for the 12th episode of School of Resistance. And please keep reading on what these wonderful women are doing for our shared future. Thank you. <laughs>